So we are going to be looking at the Grace and Truth Study Bible. Now, before we jump into this, if you haven't already, you know the drill, like, subscribe. If you really want extra credit, click the notifications icon. Anything that lets YouTube know that you enjoy this channel and you want to support us, it bumps us up in algorithms and it's a way you can tangibly help this channel continue to grow. Also, if you are enjoying the different wardrobe selections that you see in some of our videos, you can get your own over at our online store. Go to zazzle.com slash disciple dojo and you can pick up your own Bow to Your Sensei Isaiah paraphrase shirt or a number of other designs we have over there. So go check it out. Two ways that you can easily support this ministry and continue to help us grow. All right, let's look at this study Bible. So this is again, the Grace and Truth Study Bible. It's by Zondervan and the general editor is Albert Moeller. This is the hardback edition. It comes in this very shiny dust jacket, which I'm gonna remove as always. And this is what we have. I'm gonna be honest, this is not the most attractive visual design. Not sure who at Zondervan headed this up, but it's kind of this Dijon mustardy looking. I don't even know if you guys can see that with the glare, but it's, it's almost gold, but almost bronze, but not really either over a kind of odd blue color, but that's really not what's important about a study Bible. So let's dig into what you're going to find inside. It is 2,124 pages and there are 16 full color Zondervan maps in the back. Now at the beginning, after the list of the books and the different abbreviations you're going to find, there's a quick start guide and it notes right up front, this is not a packed study Bible. There are very, very few visual illustrations. I'll show you a couple in just a second. There are no essays sprinkled throughout. There are no charts. There are no infographics. There are no devotional quotes or little sidebars. None of the things that you find in a lot of other study Bibles. So this is a very streamlined study Bible, and that's worth noting up front. Then you come to the introduction and they're really up front. This project is graciously evangelical, reformed and complementarian. Then you turn a couple of pages and there's a list of contributors. Now, this is where I turned immediately when I looked at the study Bible, because I wanted to see who is contributing. That tells you a lot. And a number of the names in this study Bible did jump out at me because I have used their commentaries and their resources. I mean, people like T.D. Alexander, L. Michael Morales, Ray Ortland Jr., Dwayne Garrett, Michael Wilkins. These are solid biblical scholars. Then after the preface to the NIV, you turn and you're right into the Genesis book introduction. Now, the introductions to the books of the Bible in this are not commentary length, and they're not even as long as you would find in some study Bibles. They're between two and three pages per book. They also don't spend very much time focusing on historical, archeological, or ancient Near East, Greco-Roman background issues. They give you what you're gonna find in the book, mainly in terms of the theology, the overall images, themes, concepts, the way this book fits in with the other books in the canon or the overall meta narrative of scripture. And so I gotta say, for short book introductions, these are done really well. The ones I read all gave excellent overviews from a pretty good biblical theological perspective. I'll show you what I mean by that. The last paragraph in the Genesis introduction, they say, Genesis is a theological book. It is not primarily a book about doctrine, nor a history book, nor a scientific treatise, nor a political tract. It presents God's story of redemption, a redemption that is not just narrowly individualistic, but one that is national and ultimately universal. When readers get bogged down by the absence of scientific and historical details, they're like observers seeking to find out how many hours there are in a mile or how many colors there are in an hour. They're trying to examine a work of art with scientific rigor and methodology rather than drawing back and appreciating its breathtaking beauty. While history is important to the biblical narrative, it is noted primarily for theological reasons. Even the few events in the lives of the patriarchs in Genesis are selected from an immense number of possibilities because of their theological importance. Theology is the driving engine of the biblical narrative. And I think that's a pretty good summary, not just of Genesis, but of what you're going to find in most of the other book introductions in the Grace and Truth Study Bible. Even the study notes in the text itself 
they focus on the theological themes. They focus on things like presenting the framework theory of Genesis 1. They point out how the poetic structure of the book lends itself not to a strict chronological young earth creationist type approach, but rather is a poetic and an artistic theological presentation of the material. And they also note the different ancient Near East background points that Genesis serves as a contrast to, such as the concept of the image of God. And how in the other ancient cultures, the images of gods were actual idols and actual temples. For more on that concept, see the series here we've done on interpreting the Old Testament. In particular, the video on the image of God in a garden and what that communicates in the ancient world. And in those early chapters of Genesis, of course, there are many passages where Christians differ in their interpretation. The notes in the Grace and Truth Study Bible do a good job, for the most part, presenting those different interpretations. The notes on Genesis 6 and who the sons of God, the daughters of men, and the Nephilim are do a decent job surveying the different approaches, and they don't really press for one in particular. When you come to the Noah account, they don't focus on the geology how the flood fits with the scientific record or anything like that. Pretty much they talk about the theological importance of the flood, how it was sent as sort of a decreation, the elements of Genesis 1 being undone by God's act of judgment. So the focus is more on the theology of what the story is communicating rather than the historical or the scientific background of the story itself. And they also do a good job of grounding the text in the Abrahamic promise and how Genesis 12 kind of sets the trajectory for the rest of what you read, not just in Genesis, but in the rest of the Bible. The note at 12, one through three says, through Abram, God is going to raise to life a dead world. In Genesis 12, one through three, God blesses Abram and his descendants. Then he commissions them to an unstoppable mission to bless all families of the world. Now, if you want more on what that particular note is talking about, we unpack it here in the video, The Old Testament Summed Up in Under an Hour. I'll put a link to that message in the description below, but this is a great yet concise way of stating the importance of Genesis 12, one through three for the whole rest of the Bible. And when you come to Exodus, again, the book introduction is very good. It lays out what you're going to read when you read through Exodus and lets you know the themes to keep an eye on. Most importantly, the themes of God redeeming his people, bringing them out of slavery, and then God creating the means by which he can dwell among his people and they can approach his holy mountain, so to speak, that portable mountain known as the tabernacle. A lot of study Bibles I've looked at downplay that part of Exodus. It's almost like people trail off after the arrival at Mount Sinai and the giving of the Ten Commandments. But the introduction here did a good job of preparing the reader for what they're going to find and why what comes in the second half of Exodus is just as important as what happens in the first half. That being said, the study notes themselves in the book don't really get into any of the historical details. They don't present the two different dates of the Exodus. They don't survey the different possible routes of the Exodus, the locations of Yam Suf, the Red Sea, or Mount Sinai. And they don't even mention, at least that I saw, how the plagues correspond to the different Egyptian gods. Now, Exodus does contain two of the only illustrations that I saw while reviewing this study Bible. The illustration of the tabernacle here, and then on the following page, the illustration of the furnishings in the tabernacle. And those are literally the only illustrations that I came across in this entire study Bible. When we come to Romans, the book introduction, once again, very good. It notes that while Romans does contain a lot of theological doctrinal concepts, it was not written primarily as a doctrinal thesis. Unsurprisingly, for a Reformed complementarian study Bible, there are a lot of study notes in Romans. For most of the book, at least half the page is study notes. One thing that was surprising for a Reformed study Bible is when we come to Romans 7, the view that is adopted is actually the view that is less common among Reformed interpreters. It's not the standard view that Paul is just describing his ongoing struggle with sin and therefore every Christian's ongoing struggle with sin. The notes make very clear. No, Paul in chapter 6 is talking about how we are dead to sin and how that is to be the normal Christian life. And then in chapter 7, they say, no, Paul is not describing his everyday ongoing life as Paul struggling with sin. He is couching the entire discussion in the duality of people who are either in Adam and therefore slaves to sin or in Christ and therefore free from sin. So, 
chapter 7, the note at verse 9 says, Paul might not be talking about his own individual experience directly. Rather, he may be imagining the Garden of Eden, where there was life before the commandment came, or he may be evoking Israel before the law came. Chapter 7, verse 14. These verses are not a description of Christian experience. In Romans 7, 9 through 12, Paul puts himself in the position of Adam or Israel before the law. In Romans 7, 14 through 25, he looks back on his condition before he became a Christian when he was under the law, unspiritual, a slave to sin, and wretched. In other words, this is not how Paul felt before he was a Christian, but how he really was. And then in 7, verse 21, Paul summarizes the situation he was in before Christ, though he did not realize it at the time. Now, cards on the table. This is the right interpretation of Romans, I think. I believe that the later tradition that Paul is describing his ongoing struggle with sin, and so Romans 7 is all about how we are, as Luther said, sinners at the same time justified. I don't believe that's correct. However, in the interest of being fair and objective, not every Christian agrees. And there are arguments that have been put forward. I I don't find them convincing, but there are arguments that have been put forward that Romans 7 is talking about this paradox that we live with as no longer slaves to sin, but still unable to go a day without sinning and knowing the good that we want to do, but not being able to do it. And so wrestling and and constantly struggling with sin until the day we die. I don't think it's the accurate interpretation, but it is a widely held interpretation among Christians across the theological spectrums. And for that reason, even though I agree with the study notes here in Romans 7, I think they should have noted the other views and been more charitable in presenting them. That pains me to say that because I really think that that view of Romans 7, that Paul is just Paul talking about his everyday struggle with sin. I just think that's so wrong. But I can't let my personal theology color what I say in these review videos, which is a good study Bible should present multiple views fairly when there are long standing divisions among Christians. Then when we get to Romans 8 and 9, and especially 9 through 11, I thought the, because this is a reformed study Bible, I thought the Calvinism was going to be more heavy handed. I thought you were going to get more of the doctrines of grace approach. And it's there. I mean, this is not coming from an Arminian perspective, but the study notes also don't really press for an individualistic Calvinist reading of what Paul's doing in 9 through 11. They keep the focus at the corporate level for the most part. And I appreciated that as somebody who is not a Calvinist, who, who doesn't read this passage in the way that many Reformed readers do. The notes just do a good job of rooting the argument of Romans 9 through 11 in the Old Testament itself and how Paul is using the Old Testament to kind of bring the readers along in the story of Israel as a nation, as a people, and Gentiles as a people to show the bigger plans of God. So it's it's leaning to a Reformed Calvinist view, but it's doing so without getting into the individual election concepts that many traditional Reformed or Calvinist interpreters like to zero in on, but which I don't think Paul was actually doing. And in Romans 11, on the issue of all Israel will be saved. Who is all Israel? The approach taken, they, they once again, he doesn't really summarize the different views. It mentions that there are different ways that people have interpreted this, but the only view it really explains is the view that the all Israel will be saved refers to a large number, not the totality, but a large number of ethnic Jews coming to faith in the Messiah at some point before his return. So it would have been nice if they had presented the other view as well, that the all Israel is actually all believers, Jew and Gentile together. And that way it would have balanced out kind of the two main approaches that typically fall among the amillennial and premillennial camps. But the notes do a pretty good job of, again, keeping your view of what you're reading in this section of Romans at a macro level, at a big picture level, what God's doing in history, which is what Paul was presenting to the Roman churches. And lastly, we come to Revelation. The introduction, it's barely two pages. It gives a good overview summary of what Revelation's about, mainly the theme that Revelation was written to Christians who are about to face suffering for their faith, and that it belongs to the genre of apocalyptic. They take the position that the John who wrote Revelation is John, son of Zebedee, the apostle John, rather than a later author named John. That is not a 
universal position. Interpreters, even evangelical interpreters, are divided on who the John of Revelation is. They also emphasize, again, Revelation being apocalyptic and being prophecy, that the message in it is conveyed through symbolism, not to press the symbols in Revelation literally or try to fit them to some end times kind of dispensational roadmap or timeline in advance. They, they stay away from that and focus on the theological message of Revelation, not charting it to fit end time scenarios, which if you've seen our video here about eschatology and end times, you'll know that I think that's a wise approach when studying Revelation. Now, the notes in the text do a great job with the background of the seven churches, and we like to look at how they treat Laodicea as kind of a case study for what you're going to find. This note on Laodicea nails it. It says exactly what a good study Bible should say. It gives you the background, what the city of Laodicea was like, and the images that Jesus uses in this letter, how they resonate with Laodicea using its own known cultural stereotypes. Great job on the study notes in that regard. The study notes on the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7, again, they nail it. They hit every important point that you should when studying this passage about how what you hear in Revelation and what you see in Revelation are sometimes very different, even though they're describing the same thing. And so they note that that's what's going on with 144,000, how it is a military image drawn from the Old Testament census of Israel's fighting forces used to denote the family of believers of every tribe, language, people, and nation. So really good note at Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And then when we come to the question of the millennium in Revelation 20, the note in chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, does a good job of saying these are the main views of the millennium. And they give amillennial, premillennial, and postmillennial. They don't land on a particular view, and the notes lend themselves to being useful regardless of which of those views you take. And then that's it. After Revelation, there's nothing else. You have the table of weights and measures, and then you have the concordance. This is the NIV concordance. It's put together by Kohlenberger, and it's substantial. This is over 300 pages from page 1809 to page 2119. And that's 310 pages. That's a long concordance, but that's it. Then you have the maps and, and that's all the resources. So you're not getting essays, you're not getting articles, you're just getting book introductions, study notes, concordance, maps. Now, there were a couple of things I wanted to know when I picked this up and first saw Al Mohler as the general editor. I can't help it. My bias was, ugh, okay, this is going to be heavy handed reform Calvinism, premillennialism, um, you know, just kind of traditional Southern Baptist. It, that's just, that's what I think of for better or for worse when I think of Al Mohler because of the cultural footprint that he has left in his ministry as a champion of that corner of the evangelical landscape. So anyway, my personal bias, that was it when I picked this up. That, but I wanted to give it a fair chance because that's what I teach people we shouldn't do is let our own theological biases color how we hear and receive truth from outside of our traditions. So I looked at the Olivet Discourse. Is this going to teach left behind theology? And in Matthew 24, the note was great. It did a great job of saying, no, according to Jesus, you want to be left behind. Being taken is like being taken in Noah's day, taken in judgment, taken away by the flood. And the note says, though it is possible that those left behind will experience God's judgment, that's the left behind view, the context favors the interpretation that those who are taken are taken in judgment and those who are left behind experience God's grace. That's a good note. They mention one view that's very prevalent among a number of the people reading this Bible, but then they also point the reader back in the direction of more historic Christian orthodoxy of the past 2,000 years, not John Nelson Darby's ideas starting in the 1800s. Now, the other thing that Al Mohler is very much known for is his hard complementarianism. Um, he has made many statements about Christians who do not hold to a complementarian view that would suggest that they are compromising the gospel, that they are on the slippery slope to doing away with the inspiration of scripture or the authority of scripture or revising sexual ethics or any of the other charges of liberalism. And it's just a view that I don't think is fair. I don't think it's been presented accurately. I think 
Moeller's not the only one that does this. I think a number of people within the Gospel Coalition or Together for the Gospel, kind of that realm of evangelicalism, I don't think they've always been fair to solid evangelical non complementarian interpreters. And I was expecting the notes when it comes to that issue because it is such a contentious issue, especially within Southern Baptist circles right now at this moment in history. I was expecting the notes to be heavy handed, hard complementarian notes. Well, so what do we find? Well, let's 1 Corinthians 14, when it talks about women should remain silent, the note just says women should not audibly evaluate prophecies during church meetings. Paul does not mean that women must never speak at all during a church meeting because in this same letter, he encourages women to pray and prophesy during church meetings with their heads covered. And then that's it. So there's not a lot of time spent on it. They do take the approach that Paul is in this passage talking about women speaking in the process of interpreting prophecies that most likely their husbands had been given during that time where two or three prophets are giving a prophecy and then somebody's interpreting. At the most, this particular note on 1 Corinthians 14 is presenting more of what we would call maybe a soft complementarian approach. Then we come to the note in Ephesians, in the section, Ephesians 5.22, wives submit to your husbands. The note says the first example of ordered submission is wives, not women in general, to their own husbands, not to all husbands. So they're presenting very clearly, this is about wives submitting to their own husbands, not a general admonition that women have to submit to men. They do note that the word head refers to authority over and not to source. When it talks about man being the head of the woman, there is debate about that. And there are non complementarian scholars who say, no, actually, it's not as cut and dry as that. There's a good argument to be made that head is not being used in the sense of authority in this situation. Regardless, it's not surprising that they take the complementarian view, but it's not a heavy handed complementarianism, at least not as much as you would see in other study Bibles. And then the note goes on to say, as the church submits to Christ, wives should submit submit to husbands in every area of the relationship, excluding matters that are sinful, harmful, or contrary to God's commands. Another important caveat, this is limiting the submission. There are some complementarian approaches that would say, wives submit to the husbands, period. Your husband's beating you, he's abusing you, just pray through it, go back to him, stay with him. You know, there, there have been high level, very visible, complementarian teachers who have counseled members of their churches to do that. So 1 Corinthians 14, Ephesians 5, you're going to get complementarianism, no surprise, but it's a softer form of complementarianism than I was honestly expecting. And so that really just leaves us with the main complementarian passage of them all. 1 Timothy 2.11, the note says, according to verse 12, Paul does not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man in the church. She must not serve as pastor, teacher, or elder as the following qualifications for church leaders underscore. So they take the approach that Paul saying, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority means they can't hold that particular office. Now, again, solid evangelical non complementary interpreters take a very different approach to this entire section. And there are a number of assumptions that you have to have for the complementarian position to make sense. But if you don't share those assumptions, the position is not as sound as many complementarians like to present it as. Now, this is a study Bible review. It's not an overview of complementarianism or egalitarianism. There are YouTube teachers out there who are focusing on this. I know Mike Winger is either in the middle of or has recently done a series on complementarianism. And of course, he leans that way. And perhaps here at Disciple Dojo, maybe we'll do at least an interview or perhaps a series on why I don't find the complementarian position as persuasive as people like Mike Winger or Al Mohler or Wayne Grudem or John MacArthur or any of the other known complementarians. But it's important to know within complementarianism, there are hard complementarians and soft complementarians. And the Grace and Truth Study Bible, from what I have seen using it, if I had to classify it, Surprisingly, even with Al Mohler as the general editor, it is a softer complementarian approach. It's still complementarian. It is still no women teaching men in church leadership positions, but it's not nearly as heavy handed as you might expect if all you know is the reputation that Mohler and other 
complementarians have. So would I recommend the Grace and Truth Study Bible? Visually, it's laid out really well. I didn't mention this at the beginning like I usually do, but it's it's double columned. I don't love that. You know, I prefer single column. However, if you're going to have a double column Bible, they laid it out in a way that gives a lot of space, relatively speaking, in the margins and in the center cross-reference column where you can take notes and, and add your own cross-references and, and really engage with this on the page visually. The study notes themselves aren't super obtrusive. They're a slightly different font than the actual text itself. It's just helpful in keeping them distinguished. This is a red letter edition. So if you like that, that's helpful. And the concordance in the back is one of the longer more extensive concordances that you're going to find in a study Bible. Cards on the table. I expected I was going to have to hold my nose and get through this thing. I thought, you know, this Bible is going to do everything it can to alienate those of us who are not in that Gospel Coalition, Reform Complementarian family. And I was genuinely and pleasantly surprised at what I found. The Grace and Truth Study Bible is a good study Bible. If you are in this camp, especially, I would recommend this because it's going to give you a form of Reformed complementarianism that majors on the majors, which is the biblical theological flow of the text, and doesn't get bogged down in the minors, such as the Reformed complementarian specifics. Some people may not see that as a strength. Some people may be disappointed. They may want more explicit Calvinism. They may want more Genesis literalism. They may want more premillennial dispensationalism. And so this Bible may disappoint some people. Personally, I was pleasantly surprised. If Zondervan was going to come out with a second edition, what I would suggest is any study Bible that excludes the bulk of Christianity and by bulk, I mean those outside of Reformed complementarianism, is that's just going to be a weakness. I mean, I think you do lose something when you don't have the breadth of even just evangelicalism. It's not like you've got to include, you know, Orthodox and Coptic and Catholic and liberal Protestantism or any, it's not, what I'm saying is just within evangelicalism, there is a whole world outside of reform complementarianism. So in that regard, I think it would be strengthened with some solid Wesleyan interpreters, some solid holiness interpreters. You know, think of people like Gordon Fee or Ben Witherington or David De Silva, or Nijay Gupta, Michael Byrd, Carmen Imes, Lynn Coick, Sandra Richter. There are excellent interpreters outside of, of this particular group. So that's what I would recommend. However, I understand Al Mohler and company, they want something that just teaches that stream of theology. I get it. So just within that, I think it could use some articles. I think there is a need for things like a dictionary that explains certain terms. I think articles or essays interspersed throughout the text that explain certain things that span more than just one book of the Bible would be helpful. And I think it could use more visuals. The two that they included in here are great. I think that there are a number of places in scripture where being able to visually see things makes studying the text a lot easier. And, you know, they could put two ribbons instead of just one. So you can have Old Testament reading and New Testament reading. I mean, those are minor things, you know, cosmetics. This is not the most attractive layout. But, you know, honestly, those are minor. I mean, would it crack my top seven recommended study Bibles? No, I still think I'd put the seven I recommend in that video above this one. I mean, as long as you know that you're only getting reformed complementarianism for the most part, even though it's not super heavy handed, just know that's the bias that they're operating from. But given that qualification, the actual content that I reviewed when prepping for this video, it was good. It really was. So as always, those are my thoughts. Let me know what you think. And check out the other study Bible reviews here at Disciple Dojo. I mean, we've done close to 50, maybe more than 50 of these by now. So if there is a particular study Bible out there on the market and you want to know about it, search here on the channel first and see if we've looked at it. Chances are we probably have. The goal of these videos is just to help you have a better understanding of what's out there when you are choosing a study Bible, either for yourself or for someone else. So here at Disciple Dojo, as always, our goal is to equip, engage, empower you to go deeper in your biblical literacy and in your discipleship. Hopefully these reviews help. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time back here at Disciple Dojo. Yeah.